Thanks for that introduction, um, because yes, I really started to think about putting a sort of theoretical perspective onto the Ice Age um, in relation to that Ice Age art exhibition at the British Museum, um, which even though it was curated beautifully, I don't know how many of you actually got to see it, it was an amazing show, when the Venus of Willendorf came and paid us a visit. I know that um, one of my ex-students, Francesca, has just been paying a visit to the Venus of Willendorf in Vienna, in her red room. Um, but that show was placed in a context, they mixed the Ice Age artifacts and imagery and iconography in with um, modern art of 20th century like Matisse, um, Picasso, various uh, Modigliani, many of them nudes um, and this was such a culture clash of the way that you know, European male, overwhelmingly male with their male gaze artists were viewing a female body as this very individualistic um, separated and isolated body compared to what I'm going to talk about in terms of the the viewpoint and perspective on um, the, uh, on women in art of the Ice Age much of that art very likely having been created and curated also by women although that is um, a subject of much debate. Okay, so I will be focusing largely on European Ice Age um, material, but in order to get to that and to be able to really have any ground to make any discussion and, and have any ground for theory about that, I need to go through Africa because everything starts in Africa as far as we modern humans are concerned. Um, and um, let's just start by thinking, I'm just very briefly going to run down a few uh, markers of modernity here. Modernity implies uh, the behaviour of modern humans, behaviour that goes with becoming modern humans. But this is a rather old-fashioned and debated concept in archaeology. But I just wanted to show a timeline, and typically that timeline is... Oh, you can't see it, can you? It's too too low there. Let me... I know, I know, I can just move. No, I'll just move that up. Ah, there you go. That's pretty cool. Um, and now you can see it. There we go. Um, a little bit more. Uh, so these aspects of modernity go back in Africa way before 300,000, even before we become modern humans, including uh, the technology of blades, of, of uh, so, you know, uh, for artifacts that are twice as long um, as they are uh, wide and grindstones and pigment processing actually could go back uh, more than 300,000 years. Um, specific microlith points, um, well the microliths are a bit later but shell fishing actually comes back more than that about to the point of becoming modern humans which happens between 200, 150,000 uh, shellfishing with, um, in fact, um, pigment, um, ochre crayons and so forth, they would come here. Some microliths are coming back over there. So we go back in Africa, with, this all goes back, it's older, it, everything starts in Africa. Now art, typically understood through a sort of European lens, is always thought of in terms of being on the walls, of being figurative art, or but, but anyway certainly put onto walls, and is it really art before that? But of course this is a European fixation, and we can be pretty sure that art starts on our bodies. Um, the ochre record, which I'm not going to, or the pigment record, which is fundamentally red ochre, um, becoming ubiquitous in Africa from this stage onwards. Um, I'm not going to say very much about ochre for the simple fact that it is lush, it's just a default for our species. Wherever our species goes, ochre goes all over the place. It is the hallmark of our species. So it's kind of boring, it's, it's just there all the time. Um, so I'm only going to mention it in, in connection to other um, specific aspects of the, the artifacts. Um, so, and things like worked bones, bone tools, again, going back in Africa, very, very light. So, Africa is the beginning of everything. 
Um, and the reasons for looking at Africa first are um, if you have a good theory for the emergence of symbolic culture in Africa, then that is going to help you with any theory to explain what happens subsequently as humans move around the world, going into different environments, producing <coughs> rock art or other uh, types of art in those different environments. Um, and secondly, in terms of, well, if we think of the European Upper Paleolithic, we don't have any European hunter-gatherers. There aren't any left. Uh, so there's none left to ask about what does this rock art mean? Or do, can they tell us anything about it? Um, but if you go to Africa, we still have Bushman cultures of very, very deep time cultures with concepts and cosmologies that bear upon the rock art record that is left in southern Africa. So we can, and people have, researchers have, gone to ask Bushmen hunter-gatherers, hunting people, not many of them are these days able to do any hunting, but hunting people about the rock art. So inquiring about the rock art through the lens of hunter-gatherers very recent lived experience and their their, cons their their cosmology is obviously a worthwhile thing to do okay um, just a rather old map and out of date but it's meant to indicate the spread of symbolic artifacts I'm again stressing Europe isn't the place it starts I'm just wanting to remove any impression of being Eurocentric despite the fact I'm going to be focused on Europe um, the things that need adding so there are key sites so these are the beautiful bone harpoons from Katanda in Congo um, they should be here um, very far ahead of the Upper Paleolithic, 90,000, 50,000 years before the Upper Paleolithic there. Um, uh, ostrich eggshells being found in Tanzania, 70,000. There should be Blombos and um, Pinnacle Point down here. Um, basically any symbolic artifact is going to be two or three times older in Africa than anywhere else on the planet. Okay, uh, But we've also got obscured here which ought to be added uh, Borneo and Sulawesi I'll be showing you examples of the rock art from there uh, so that part of the world currently holds the uh, title of oldest rock art by modern humans because of course what ought to be added we've got a few Neanderthal symbolic artifact sites here for the Chateau Peroni in the middle of France but recently Spanish Neanderthals have been shown to be just so far ahead of the curve. Um, 64,000 year old rock art, which we'll have a look at, um, and further to that, uh, cosmetic paint kits that reach back well over 100,000 years, equal in age to Blombos down here. The Neanderthals have an independent and parallel development in Europe. Now, I'm not going to talk much about the end, I'll show you a little of that, but I won't talk much about it tonight. It's a whole separate lecture to compare Neanderthals with modern humans, but there is a lot to be said about Neanderthals and modern humans. Um, the very oldest burials, uh, Kafse, uh, the very oldest rituals, symbolic burials, Kafse and, and school at the gateway of um, Africa in Israel, Palestine. Um, and we're seeing the red ochre that's part of so those burials have loads of red ochre as usual um, shell jewelry and grave goods of animal parts so they really have the full whack of symbolic uh, symbolic artifacts um, there's border cave burial down here which is also a, a symbolic burial a little bit later than that um, that sort of ochre striated and ground ochre is also marking some of the earliest entrance to Australia which is happening Maj Majebebe 65 is older than these dates 65,000 so we have got symbolic artifacts going all over the place well before the European Upper Paleolithic usually taken to start in about 40 odd thousand years ago okay so just a very few quick examples of the southern African artifacts um, from the Middle Stone Age, it's red ochre, 
as usual, red ochre crayons. This is an Olive Boomport example. Very honed crayons, which could be maybe were honed to create powder from red, blood red hematite, or to create a point for design. Um, this is the famous original engraved ochre. It's, it's four shots of the same piece. The original engraved ochre um, piece, block of hematite from Blombos Cave, right at the southern tip of South Africa. Um, and you can see that engraved in, uh, motif there. We're going to have a look at these geometric engravings. And this is a recent find at, or recently published at Blombos, is the f uh, supposedly the first drawing, which again is being done in red ochre. Red ochre was a subject, a, a substance of such value that it was hidden, curated, um, mined in these areas. Red ochre was the gold of its time. Um, and it, it stayed as the gold of its time for a long time. Um, so this is the first apparent drawing, supposedly. And it's, this is 76,000, 75,000. This could be a bit older, still be um, a bit older. So it's in the region 100 to 70,000, these, these artifacts. Twice as old as anything Upper Paleolithic. Associated for Blombos is this beautiful shell jewellery necklace um, of Nasarius shells. Some of these shells have been heat treated to create a reddish colour. Um, so the colour isn't actually coming from like ochre on the skin of whoever was wearing it. It's, it's been specially sort of heat treated into the shells. There are examples of highly similar shell jewellery right around from south to north Africa in Egypt in Morocco and also from Shkul and Kafs uh, uh, just outside Africa. Um, so this is in the this is in the time frame of this is about seventy odd thousand years, um, but some examples may go back eighty ninety thousand years potentially. Um, okay, and okay, another very interesting ritual site in Africa. This is an inland site um, in Botswana, Rhino Cave, uh, from uh, in the Sodilo Hills, which is a uh, out of the flat plain of the Kalahari rises as these special little range of hills which has a lot of ritual significance for Bushman peoples that live in that vicinity including the Jeune and um, Rhino Cave is actually named for a painting that is a later painting of a rhino but the um, what is so interesting about the cave is there are Middle Stone Age artifacts of the order of 70 to 80,000 and this this extraordinary rock, which is a natural rock formation, um, but it is believed to have been modified. That it's, it's not necessarily easy to see um, on the photo, but it's, it's had ground cupules into the, this huge great rock, um, which in certain uh, sunlight, directions of sunlight, create a scalar effect. And if you can see, the, there's a kind of eye and a mouth and it has been argued that this is a serpent. It's a mighty snake. It's been talked about in that way. Um, Jeune Trois people who've been in the area for many, many long, long time um, refer to the site in terms of magic for hunting and snake magic. There is an enormous amount of mythology concerning snakes and serpents um, around that. So that is Sheila Coulson, the Norwegian archaeologist, has, has talked about this as a ritual site with that, that serpent rock. And she's found these extraordinary microlith spear points. Now they're extraordinary because they're made of a very special quartz that again has been heat treated to create a, a reddish colour and then they've, they've never been used. They've just been broken and burnt and destroyed deliberately. So these are ritualistic artefacts being somehow sort of sacrificed or, or, or destroyed. Um, so she's interpreted it in terms of ritual rather than um, material usage. Um, so this is a, a, a most um, extraordinary site as well and it's in the order 70 to 80,000 years old Botswana. Um, so it's not just the seacoast sites but the inter in interior of Africa um, showing this, this ritual matter. Now we haven't, it's incredibly difficult to date rock art 
in Africa and almost surely there must be the first rock art in Africa it's just we don't know where it is and we don't know how old it is uh, but the dating of the oldest rock art has come outside Africa as such okay so now um, what was I okay so I'm going to talk about two models I'm going to try and look through the lens of African hunter-gatherer experience and what is generated and expressed in rock art um, and then apply that to the European uh, the, uh, the European record and I hope as Chris says I'm going to have enough time for this so I want to do a spot of Bushman cosmology in rock art very very quickly just introduce a few concepts there and I'm going to use two models because I think they are the, the best models to use and they're not necessarily co contradictory um, but uh, so I'm going to use the, the model that is characteristic of RAG is, is the, the main model that RAG has used uh, all these years um, this comes from Chris Knight's Blood Relations and it's just the, the basic explanation of the sex strike theory um, so uh, women this is the model of lunarchy waxing moon ritual power waning moon relax ritual power sex strike menstruation signaling no to marital relations um, but being allied with brothers and that is expressed through red ochre menstruation taboo creation of the no by saying we are the wrong sex and the wrong species M husbands can't possibly have sex with us because we've turned into animals and we've turned into males as well um, and so this is the phase of blood menstruation and then hunting can happen when the moon the moon is getting brighter and brighter in the night sky the waxing gibbous moon is the bright moon which will give the hunters now we're thinking of hunting in the European ice age going on mammoth hunts and such like you need to have light in the sky right up to full moon the moon rises at sunset you get the moon all night but of course after full moon no longer does the moon rise after sunset you have darkness after sunset now we know from Tanzania that that is the time when lions eat people because people walk around foolishly after sunset in the darkness before the moon rises and the lions or leopards jump on them uh, the European Ice Age was for, you know, full of huge feline saber-toothed cats and giant lions and carnivores going to ready to eat people so people wouldn't be walking around foolishly either at the dark of the moon or uh, just after full moon so this is the time the hunt comes back the hunt is brought back the bleeding animals brought back to be cooked on the fire cooking fire taboo taboos are all relaxed um, the raw gives way to the cooked the menstrual taboo gives way to marital sex flesh can be consumed whether that is the flesh of women or the flesh of animals in the original menstrual sex strike women's flesh is identified with animals flesh and women's blood with animals blood this is like the original totemic relationship okay so this is our sex strike theory um, and I'm going to pull out what is that telling us about what we would expect to see in Ice Age art and then I'm going to be highly selective obviously uh, about the examples I show you but I will show you that it, it does help us get get closer to it get closer to some understanding of it okay the the great um, sort of revolutionary major hypothesis about rock art um, of the past we are talking 70 um, 40 years 40 years about this is the so-called shamanic hypothesis by David Lewis Williams um, and I do not think of this as opposed to female cosmetic coalitions or sex right um, it's got a lot to offer it's got it's given us an extraordinary insight into what's going on in the uh, southern African rock art and then David Lewis Williams has himself moved from southern Africa to examine the upper Paleolithic and, and Europe as well and um, in his first so so what is the shamanic hypothesis in brief is that uh, David Lewis Williams and his colleagues have understood the art of southern africa the bushman art in terms of religious experience of 
uh, the different Bushman cultures in their healing rituals um, and that through the experience of healing dance which has been called trance we're going into altered states of consciousness the shamans or healers um, have uh, visions and hallucinations so-called entoptic imagery it's a it's a neurophysiological model that then meshes with cultural entities um, so entoptic imagery is the imagery that comes up between the, the optic nerve and the brain and the, and the conscious thinking brain it comes up with geometrics zigzags dots um, squares various images that kind of float in front of the eyes and then after going through a, a kind of de a, a, a trance state or an altered state of consciousness a sort of vortex shamanic vortex it resolves into it's construed into culturally meaningful entities that they often be take the form of animals or various entities sorcerers tricksters various whatever it might be now <laughs> provocatively <laughs> I've put up the shamanic hypothesis with what I can see as images of menstrual ritual and the reason I've done this is because originally when David Lewis Williams first um, brought his uh, examined the uh, son the Bushman rock art Khoisan uh, rock art um, he was arguing for um, this particular image for instance which is from the Drakensberg mountains Fulton's Rock he was decoding it as an image of a menstrual ritual with the girl inside the hut and the dance of the menstrual ritual the characteristic dance which is known as Elam Bull dance being danced around her and he interpreted it in, in these ways and he aligned the ritual power and mobilization in menstrual ritual and in the boy's first kill ritual when the boy first killed an eland the eland <coughs> sacred animal we'll talk about and the healing dance ritual he saw them all as parallel processes but subsequently he decided no actually not it's all about healing he left aside <coughs> the gender relations he left aside the gender and initiation um, of which there is, uh, is so much uh, discussed in the mythology of these groups in the ritual practice of these groups uh, menarchal ritual is the primary site for the use of red ochre for instance and there is there is you know demonstrable continuity of that over many many tens of thousands of years so David Lewis Williams decided instead no we're gonna you can see it's, it's structured in almost the same way you have somebody being healed placed inside a kind of shelter uh, some sort of shelter from the wind and then the healing dance which is a circular dance uh, circular framework with people singing in the uh, and, 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 and in the outside then it looks like it could be the same thing so he says no actually it's a healing dance he changes his mind and then subsequently with a colleague Thomas Dowson he starts interpreting a figure like this I hope how, gonna, how cl clear it is to see her, her here um, saying this is this is the visual the hallucinations arising as a result of shamanic visions and shamanic healing hmm so this actually it, it, that tells you're just sort of left wondering well why where's the bows and arrows and why is there ears here and why well, what about all this sex stuff what about all this red ochre blobs of power here what and others have said well but you're leaving out far too much you're not explaining so many aspects of this so if we look at this instead as a men instead I don't want the word instead if we look at this as a menstrual maiden in initiation her first menstruation ritual uh, uh, Kalahari first menstruation a girl in first menstruation would have the Elambul dance being danced uh, she would be in her menstrual heart she would be at one point given weapons bows and arrows 
the only time she would ever touch the weapons the arrows because her menstrual blood would destroy the poison you can see these hunters have taken away the arrows from her um, because her blood power would destroy that poison so I'm able to start explaining this one and that one by making the reference to menstrual initiation rites um, so she she goes through a drama where she's she is a hunter and she shoots with a bow, bow and arrow to give it luck in here she becomes both the Elam bull but she is also the hunter of the Elam bull who's that's actually the Elam bull summoned by her potency um, during this ritual and here look at this the, the gender what what is the gender of this entity and um, clearly there's an animal head I'm calling her she because she's very fat and that fatness is a female characteristic for Bushmen um, but look there's a there's a vulva but this is a bit of a piece isn't that a piece um, so we've got like two sexes packed into one figure we've got a human and an animal in one figure we've got a, a prey and a predator in one figure uh, a hunted and a hunter and a male and a female it's like a, a u total you know unity of uh, of opposites in there now when david lewis williams says these are referring to trance i believe him but they're also referring to gender rituals as well um, and the reason i'm saying that is that for the bushman it's not one thing or the other thing menstrual healing trance uh, sorry healing trance and menstrual ritual will refer to each other and i'm going to show you what that looks like in bushman rock art um, here we have another example interpreted by peter garlake a uh, student following lewis williams and he again interprets this in terms of trance and okay we've got all these great this is red ochre and that's sort of black dark ochre that's been superimposed great red lines of potency coming from uh where okay between the legs okay right up straight through the horns of these great antelopes okay right this is healing dance uh right okay these these are definitely showing indicators of trance because they're bleeding from the nose we'll talk about that in a minute um and, and look, garlic cuts off the image. Look what she's got. I'm going to compare this image thousands of miles away as it is and thousands of years different time period as it is subsequently with a very famous East European Upper Paleolithic image, the Venus of La Salle. It's almost exactly the same iconography. Um, and so she's got this sort of rattle that's shaped in a sort of lunar crescent form. The lunar waxing moon would apply to a bushman menstrual girl it's it's the timing of her release from menstrual seclusion is the waxing moon um so okay so this if this is trance or healing dance well it's it's bloody powerful you know menstrual power as well um the two things are being equate look at this there is the girl that's her place and she's always got a companion she's never by herself you get pairs of these beautiful fat maidens they're lovely and fat these maidens and look what is here alongside her deliberately alongside her this is a trance healer this is a shaman gone into a condition of he's gone into what's known by the junquas yeah he's he's just died he's died before he can um, start to heal and he's stuck with arrows he's shot with arrows of healing which is the idiom of um, being shot in the stomach with these arrows and then the energy this huge mom energy as it's called by the jeune class he starts rising up the spine and comes shooting out of the top of the head and then the the healers kind of goes into this uh, here's a jeune croix healer here going through the experience of yeah and as soon as he's coming round everybody kind of helps him he's gone he's shivering he's shaking his legs have wobbled his uh his, the, the whole work he's shaking shaking is actually the core of the experience um and then 
so he emerges from that he can see properly he can see the illness and he can start to pull the illness he can start to talk to God about you know let my people take this illness away it, talking to God in a very egalitarian uh, way not in any sort of pleading worshipping way you know in a very egalitarian way insulting God shaking the fist at so-called God um, so that it, that is a picture of the same pose that is a healer right against juxtaposition against the menstrual maiden I am saying that the Bushmen are making an equation of these forms of potency they talk they are in the art talking about healing in terms of menstrual ritual a menstrual ritual in terms of healing it's not a it's the it's this or it's that they are constantly informing each other and these two examples I should say these are Zimbabwe Bushman art they're not southern Ar so South Africa is it's Zimbabwe um, and these examples are many thousands of years old because they're coming from Bushman cultures now extant there are no longer any Bushmen in those areas these it, th these are as they are on the rock panel of the Matapos Hills the, the plateau of Zimbabwe these uh, I've put deliberately against each other so that's an artifact that's not how it appears on the rock but they are saying the same thing we have um, this is again this is the healer lying prone right it's a very small figure you can't e easily see it and as people are transformed through the healing um, the shaking and the experience the extraordinary arousal that's going on in the the arising of this potency this energy of the healing people are climbing ropes to the sky you can see how these ropes become this giant serpent the people who's lost in the folds of this serpent the serpent right at the top with its ears and its nose and its, its ble nose bleeding which is and there's some giant entity so this god is actually well what sort of god is this entity again the potency is coming from yeah right there between the letters so and we've got this zigzag so here it's this folds of the snake going like that or this zigzag potency periodicity again so trance experience the people going up and down now what what is that place in in the understanding of the Kalahari Bushmen this is entry to first creation the first order of existence so we're going from the mundane world which is second creation into first creation here um, to talk to the gods talk to the gods on absolutely level terms about you heal my people you let them go um, you you cure them now um, and first creation is the time before time when there is no death no sickness so in order to heal you need to re-enter first creation uh, the trickster is the one the entity I mean this is our trickster is the hair-headed being menstrual gender ambivalent creature uh, tricksters are very gender ambivalent um, governs the entry to first creation in that time before time people had eland heads um, some of these people will have eland heads but that's quite a good eland head um, so okay so this is a it's just an equation that the potency of menstrual ritual and the potency of healing ritual on potency in in the parlance of the jeune classe is all the same potency and I'm say, saying this is very important for us to remember when we're looking into the the um, artifacts of the upper Paleolithic if we ever get there so let's let's get there um, and shall I just read oh uh, I just want to say something about the Eland ah uh, maybe I'm going I'm going to skip oh. I hate this rushing <laughs> just hate this. I want to read this was the first piece of Bushman rock art um, transcribed and drawn by a European person in 1874 or just before by James Alpin in the Drakensberg so we have been seeing rock art well we saw some from Zimbabwe but also some from the Drakensberg mountains in, in near Lesotho um, and and he asked he he was very sympathetic with the with the Bushmen the Maluti Bushmen the mountain Bushmen of the area were being 
hunted to extinction at the time by the farmers in bringing coming into the area and, um, and King um, King I, uh, King was the the young guy who gave a, a narration to James Alpen about what is this what is what, what do you understand by this so he said this let's just hear what he said the men with rebox heads so rebox a little antelope so these are antelopes here and the tailed men live mostly underwater they tame elands and snakes that animal which the men are catching is a snake they're all underwater they are people spoilt by the dance because their noses bleed Kagan gave us the song of this dance and told us to dance it and Kagan is the name of a trickster it's a very well-known name of a trickster in the southern area of the Bushmen and people would die from it it's describing the death of trance and death of healing and he would give charms to raise them again. It is a circular dance of men and women following each other. So women are dancing too. Women often sing instead of dance. But and it's danced all night. Some fall down, some become as if mad and sick. Blood runs from the noses of others whose charms are weak and they eat charm medicine in which there is burnt snake powder. So it's just giving us some inkling of the symbolism and the um, underwater it's it's a it, it's definitely making it clear that these pictures are referring to the experience of the healing dance and that was the that testimony of the young Maluti Bushman King to James Alpern was really the basis for uh, uh, David Lewis Williams to you know, confirm his supposition that we're looking at um, art of religious experience here which <laughs> incredibly up until the 1970s very few people were willing to acknowledge about Bushman um, rock art okay um, the the major symbol that unites the girls menstrual ritual and the trance or healing dance is the symbolism of the eland so the girl's menstrual ritual is the eland bull dance we we saw the image of the uh, uh, fulton's rock which really is i believe a, a depiction of eland bull dance and she herself the girl in menstruation turns into the eland bull she metamorphoses into the eland bull and the women around her are mating pantomiming mating with that that bull but this uh, this depiction so these are people with eland heads by re-entering first creation through the healing experience people recover their eland heads they start to metamorphose we have the sequence of metamorphosis into eland and the what the culmination of the energy rises and as the healer goes into his altered state of consciousness is understood the metaphor is the death of the eland the eland is shivering and shaking and bleeding from the nose and his hair is up on end um, and so we can see here some examples of this sequence of the transformation of the healer into eland and then a sort of takeoff the bleeding, the shivering, the shaking, the, um, the, the sort of energy potency coming from the back of the neck as it's conceived, a sp special spot on the back of the neck where it comes. So these are stages of transformation into trance. Um, just go, just nip back onto, <coughs> the same thing is happening in these <coughs> tiny little figures. They're being metamorphosed and we're going to see some of that in the Upper Paleolithic. Okay, so now where are we going? All right, so that was my tour to Africa. Oh, I'm going to have to take a bit longer, sorry. Um, so let's now just start to look at um, rock art as such. Um, from the, the dating on Bushman rock art is very difficult. Much of what I was showing you is within a few hundred years. The Zimbabwe art, some of that may be thousands of years and could almost be as old as some of the most recent Upper Paleolithic, potentially, but it's very hard to date. That what is believed to be the oldest human 
modern, sorry, I shouldn't say human, modern human rock art is now sighted in Borneo. It's only recently this was an announced, this discovery. I don't know if you can <coughs> see, there's a, a beautiful cow down here. So this is seen as figurative art, so de realistic depictions of animals. Um, and so this is the oldest figurative art, so called. I'm not clear what this entity is, is here exactly. Um, and these hand prints could be as old as uh, 50,000. These negative hand prints, we'll see a lot more of these. Um, not far, well, they're, they're really outposts of the Southern Asian um, expansion of modern humans. For anyone who's not clear, modern humans are emerging from Africa, or they're starting to pop outside of Africa, maybe a hundred thousand years ago, school and cuff say as an example, but the major migration out of Africa is probably coming closer to 60, 70,000 years, where people are moving around the Indian Ocean, so they're coming into the areas of Borneo, Sulawesi, well we know that they're getting into Australia, 60, 65 maybe. Um, so this rock art again, Sulawesi, beautiful pigs, hands and so on. Um, we're now this is older than the oldest rock art of the Upper Paleolithic, apparently. But of course, this has all been trumped because... Uh, oh, no, sorry, I'm getting... Uh, we're going to come to the Neanderthals in a moment. I'm just showing you what is the oldest we've got a date in Africa. This isn't actually... This is, is uh, engraving on portable stone rather than a, a, a cave wall. Um, so Apollo 11 cave of Namibia with a date going up to 28, 29,000. Um, what's very interesting, just to mention, I'll come back to it, is uh, the comparability of the iconography in the Apollo 11, because this is a, seen as a feline, a lion, and then has these human-like legs at the back. So this is, Lewis Williams, for instance, would immediately start thinking of it in terms of a therianthrope, a, per, a, a beast man, which would be indicative of going into the mode of a lion, a healer could become a lion and go and go across the desert. So this would be something shamanic. And um, we have this beautiful, I'll show you more of this, the beautiful mammoth ivory from Germany. The date is not very far removed, 33,000 to 28, 29,000. Um, again, a therianthrope, a head and a human's legs, lion head and the human's legs. It's a very similar grammar. Um, okay, just a quick uh, rehearsal of the main periods of the Upper Paleolithic um, in Europe, when we go to Europe. Uh, roughly 40 to 10,000 years is the whole stretch. The first 10,000 years is uh, mainly known as Aurignacian. That's the industry, referring to the toolkits, the industry from 40 to 30,000. Um, and this is represented by masses of ochre, jewelry, um, masses of beads, burials, the sculpted figures, I'll show you lots of vulvas, so-called vulvas, we should have a look. Chauvet Cave is the main star cave of this period. The Gravettian period, 30 to 20,000 years, the Venus figures, um, including pottery and textile uh, examples in, uh, emerging at that time. Um, the glacial maximum, this is all Ice Age, the glacial maximum uh, the coldest time is 21,000 years ago, very cold. Uh, the Magdalenian after that period starts to get increasingly a little bit warm, the, the cold relaxes to some extent. The Magdalenian is the period of the great caves like Lascaux. Um, I'm not going to really show that much of Lascaux, a little bit, but... Uh, uh, okay, so this is a modern human, Cro-Magnon, um, so-called Cro-Magnon. <coughs> and modern humans believed responsible for all these industries. Um, worth mentioning, Aurignacian jewellery, you can see the extraordinary variety, so this is the early phase of the Upper Paleolithic, extraordinary variety of jewellery, and that strongly contrasts to the fact that in Africa, the shell jewellery is amazingly similar for an amazingly long amount of time, North and South Africa, you won't get this kind of variety. This has been interpreted by Francesco Derrico and colleagues as indicative of a lot of little groups, little ethnic groups with their own little 
tribal boundaries and languages and badges of identity. Possibly so. Um, right, so this is the, the real surprise. Um, I'm not going to say much about the Neanderthals, but first of all, um, the dating of these handprints, it's the Spanish Neanderthals that are just ahead of the curve. Um, the dating of these handprints, uh, El Castillo Cave, okay, northern Spain, is before modern humans are believed to be anywhere near, so they must be Neanderthals. And then came this fantastic bombshell of the La Pasiega imagery, which is actually a complex pretty close to El Castillo, 64,000 years ago, Neanderthal rock art, and some incredible, I mean, actually the first figurative art, I mean, this is animals, yeah, there's a pig here, there's a cow there, lots of red dots, I mean, Lewis Williams would have a field day with this as entoptic imagery, um, and strange spiritual entities, hmm, you could, you could have a whole lecture on interpreting this one, um, but I'm not going to go down that path, uh, ladders <laughs> to the, I'm not going to go down that path, I haven't got enough time here, um, but it's fantastic, you know, Neanderthals are doing it, um, and they are doing cosmetic kits and painting and shell jewellery, at least as early as Blombos down in southern Africa. So they have really have a parallel development. There's lots to say about the comparative kind of... They, they follow the same sequence. They get ochre first, shell jewellery and paint kits, and then rock art. They follow the same sequence of development that we do. Just, just ahead of the curve. Okay, we're talking about modern humans now. Um, we're going to have a romp through. It really will be a romp through, won't it? Um, the first great painted cave of, of the European Upper Paleolithic, Chauvet, um, uh, upwards of 30,000 years, through 33,000 years. There was some dispute about the date, but I think it's very strongly um, asserted now. Um, with extraordinary, I mean, compared with the Borneo and Sulawesi, these are just so beautifully sophisticated. There's, there's paintings of animals in a way that's suggestive of the animal's movement and behavior. It's quite extraordinarily beautiful. Um, and the paintings have gone with the surface of the cave to have very 3D effects, often of the animals coming rushing out of rock clefts, as though those clefts in the rock are kind of the, the reproductive or totemic source of those animals. Um, and there's a fabulous film that I really recommend if anyone wants to. Some people may have seen The Cave of Forgotten Dreams, which gives a beautiful <coughs> detailed survey of Chauvet with Werner Herzog um, doing his thing and <laughs> it's all very good fun and really interesting. Now there are hard, there's no human beings in Chauvet except this. Um, so we've seen the lion man for one but this is our human figure of Chauvet. There are handprints in Chauvet I should say but the human figure is here and this is in the the most De the most difficult to reach part of the cave, like deep inside um, to, to actually get arrive at that place and it's quite difficult to get the sight of it um, uh, so that you actually see this effect which is of, if it's not quite clear, we, the, that's the rock shape and this is a great bison with its curvy horns and its leg but look that leg turns into the leg of a woman with very clear genitalia on there. So this is our female, this is our, our figure, our human figure, clearly therianthropic, absolutely clearly metamorphosing into an animal or out of being an animal. Okay. Um, and then of course the, at the same time period, I'm just re repeating the beautiful lion person, lion human, again the therianthrope um, interpreted as shamanic in I, I, the uh, emblem of shamanic experience, the, the beast man, the lion man. And there we have woman and bison. It, it should be pretty clear that the eland, which is a giant antelope, a great antelope that belongs to Africa, doesn't exist in the European Upper Paleolithic, but I'm going to pretty much demonstrate that the bison is playing the role of the eland in the Upper Paleolithic, um, for women especially. Okay, so um, from Germany, so that was um, 
you know, the, that, that was Chauvet, south of France, and um, uh, Hollenstein Stadel, but close to Cologne. Vogelherd is also um, southern Germany. Um, these beautiful ivory pieces, so they're really small, that's <coughs> centimeter scale. These are really small, beautiful little hand fit in the hand pieces. Um, notice the motifs, the geometric motifs here. Every one of these, the beautiful horse has little motifs on his saddle back there. Um, the lion head, these diamond shaped cross cutting. It, it is reminiscent, highly reminiscent of the geometric engravings that were in the Blombos hematite on the red ochre in Blombos. Um, though many people who are archaeologists of the European Upper Palaeolithic will say, oh no, you can't bring stuff in Africa to talk about. You know, why? Okay, why not? You can if you've got a strong enough theory for it. Um, characteristic of the Aurignacian are figures that have been called, termed by experts like André Lerregrand as vulva figures. They are very evidently, I mean we've seen one vulva figure already in, in Chauvet Cave and that's pretty evidently so. And these come in a different, in various forms. Um, nearly all these red ochre or else they actually get ground into rock or into plaquettes so this has been pretty I mean that's taken a lot of work this triangle made as a, a as a kind of emblem of female sex ground into the rock it's taken a lot of work to do that um, here just maybe, maybe, maybe I can maybe I if that helps um, and these different sorts of shapes with sort of rounder forms, some of these could be quite enigmatic. That are they a shape of a, a female sex or are they hoof prints or animal tracks? And again, I would assert with the bush view that they can change. The w woman becomes the animal, the woman becomes the animal. Um, and here, so this is La Ferrecy. These are mainly French examples in the early Aurignacian. And we've got this sort of diamond shape in amongst the legs of an animal. So the identity, female sex to animal, being you know, constantly reiterated. There is a lot of this going on in the Aurignacian. Um, all right, so let's have a look at our Venuses to start with, and then I'll just bring up some predictions any chance to get through all this. Um, one of the very earliest Venuses, I think this is Austrian, Galgenberg, um, over 30,000. Most of the Venuses are Gravettian after the 30,000 mark. Um, this is actually made of a schist, so it's a kind of rock, it's, it's a kind of stone. Um, and here is the, probably the very, uh, the oldest to date, the magnificent Hohler Fels Venus, something like 35,000, even older. It's right at the beginning of the Aurignacian, this one. Um, quite, you can see the centimetre scale. Again, you can put her into your hand. She's, she's been carved from mammoth ivory. Um, there's, a, there's a little, she's some sort of pendant because her head is gone. Lost her head, which could be an expression of healing or trance experience. Um, but there is so much detail in this tiny figure. There's so much power associated to her reproductive attributes and maternal attributes of course um, but look at the you know all the ingrat the marking the grooving the chevron marking um, so much attention to details and an effort how much time has been put into this tiny figure um, enormous amount um, and little doubt about the sort of focus of energy and power in in this figure so we're now coming down to some of the more the, the better known the famous Willendorf um, that Francesca recently visited and again this is a tiny figure made of uh, you know, um, a, again an ivory and um, the details the specific details with such effort these are tiny these details and on her little arms are little jewellery bracelets and then the detail of her coiffure, her hair, hair dressing. Um, so the emphasis on, well, it's not nakedness, it's, it's being, she's been dressed in very special ways.
yeah um, she was a court and of course there is there are traces of ochre associated to her I should keep mentioning that because I keep thinking oh ochre is boring but the ochre is there all the time um, so she's about 25 Francis what's the latest date they're giving 25 26 more than that 26 thank you um, Dolivis Nietzsche is an extraordinary site I'm not gonna have enough time to, to talk about um, but this is Donovis Nietzsche is giving us so this is Moravia southern Czechoslovakia on a on a, a mammoth migration route um, which would have been one of the richest most abundant big game hunting areas of, of the whole continent um, this is baked clay this is fired clay highly fired pottery so this is our earliest real examples of pottery I mean this is very old 27,000 BP um, before to now and um, there are also examples of textiles um, it, from the cultures the Moravian cultures um, so this is really very naked unusually naked the, this Venus but so you've still got details of the eyes and so on um, Kostyanki, Ukraine again you've got these little little bits of itsy bitsy textiles these cultures were generating textiles plant um, uh, plant made textiles um, could also be leathers obviously as well but these are these are kind of delicate lingerie like ritual apparel of something of that nature um, and archaeologists like Olga Sofa have argued that um, these are probably a woman originating industry of these textiles and that they are being celebrated the, the skills and the the beauties of these textiles are being celebrated in these figures with these um, Parent figures at different reproductive phases she even though she may look as though she's pregnant I would be very wary of that interpretation because the great the fat potent figures of the Bushman artist are often referring to menstruating maidens so potency and fatness um, may not literally represent pregnancy they certainly represent fertility I would argue but and again the hairstyles we get many more examples Le Pug, um, incredibly so that's the back of the Le Pug from France figure with this this is ambiguous is that a skirt like a pubic apron um, or is it a, fl a reference to flow or both of those things going on uh, or is it the delicate textiles being referenced again beautiful clean lined mammoth ivory and extraordinary I'm going to show this figure again for the issue of, of gender in just a minute um, more examples from France the beautiful hairstyles and coiffure so this is going repeatedly that these Venus figurines are looking at more than 200 examples um, analyzed across Europe right from France right the way to the Urals Ukraine and the Urals um, they have this exquisite detailing of decoration cosmetic apparel ritual apparel um, jewelry beautiful hairstyling being emphasized so they're not just naked figures now of course some of <coughs> some people some not very imaginative usually male archaeologists have tried to argue these are pornographic <laughs> though they have not referred to the hunter-gatherer record ethnographic record that gives them any justification for doing so in in my work with the Hadza I've come across um, Olenakwete dolls which are clay fired they have they are a special clay I'll we'll talk about in a moment but they would be somewhat similar in terms of the baked clay of Don Nietzsche um, and they're made by a woman's relatives for a young pregnant woman fundamentally um, and they're made of a very special clay which is gained ga taken from termite mounds the association with termites is of fatness plenty um, fertility basically and what happens when they've they've baked these in the in the sort of half fire um, with this special clay is the weight of the doll when it's wrapped in a, a cloth is almost like the weight of a young baby when it's born and it's got a skin texture that's almost like so it's like the, the woman is carrying 
that doll is a sort of practice of her habits when she's got that baby with her and there is a special naming of that entity that that unequated doll with a name of a, a relative who's going to be um, likely to become the name of the child um, so this does not look to me like um, something poor that these are not uh, pornographic objects uh, uh, just that um, I would think of them in terms of objects that associate to women's rites of passage whether they be menstruation or whether they be rites of passage connected with childbirth or other reproductive stages um, and it's as if they are making like a, an immediate uh, that moment is being kind of crystallized or made into stone into ivory that moment of the ritual action the ritual activity is being you know fossilized ossified into that moment um, and made permanent so it, it, it has some obviously some great importance I would argue that this is mainly uh, women's curation and creation um, even if you did acknowledge that men were partly responsible for um, making these objects it's still talking about sex strike isn't it because men wouldn't be busy making those objects if they had actual women to get their hands on this probably my thought about it um, but the places that most of those Venus figurines have been found are often in domestic fire pits which indicates that they're spaces where women basically are are kind of in control and would not really be places where men would likely to be playing with sort of erotic fantasies necessarily okay I'm gonna how, how far I'm, I'm gonna run to late o'clock Chris I'm gonna try and gallop through to late there's a very rare exception we made I, I'm really sorry I've, I've packed too much in here this should actually be two lectures and then it would work yeah yeah okay yeah I bet they do okay so I'm now gonna start to try and really interpret this and then I'm gonna run and burn a few images and I'm just gonna gallop through if we take female cosmetic coalitions or sex strike as our basis for a lens for looking into um, this material we've already had a bit of a go at it I, I just want to make some sharpen it up a little bit and make you know what would we predict what would we expect to come out of the upper Paleolithic art we would expect to focus on reproductive potency I think we've seen that with Hola Fells yeah, reproductive potency is the 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 the, the first ritual potency um, we would expect coalitions you might argue that those Venus figurines all look as though they're by themselves they are very individualistic and personalized and they could represent a woman herself in the course of the Rite de Passage but think of the decoration that's gone into them they're quite clearly referring to women who have co you know allies who have been doing participating in those rituals okay. so coalitions must be part of the story women are linked to game animals must be identified with game animals <clears throat> and the production of flesh women's production of flesh and men's production of game animals are magically intertwined amongst the Hadza if a woman menstruates she shoots a poisoned arrow um, when her husband tracks game it's as if it's during the pregnancy it affects the pregnancy of his wife when the big game is killed it's like childbirth the, the phases of reproduction are equated to the phases of production um, they're parallel and intertwined and magically affecting each other those processes we expect the cosmology to be lunar without a doubt <coughs> it will be lunar and menstrual how do you represent the other world if you're coming out of the sex strike model <clears throat> you could use abstract geometrics because that is not referring to anything you, we don't have abstract geometrics in the what you we have normal sort of pens and bottles and co we, we have palpable things abstract repeated formal repeated motifs would be indicative of ritual repetition therefore it's the other world okay or you create impossible monsters you become the wrong species you become a beast person 
a fairy anthrope, you become a people with a person with an eland head or a bison head or a lion head. And this one, and this is really important for discussing the gender relations of of the Upper Paleolithic, you fuse both sexes into a gender of power. So when you are in the, power, the mode of ritual power, you possess the aspects of the other sex. I'm going to really show, go to town on that. I've got to show this one. I think we've seen some of the examples of that one. <clears throat> so I'm just going to really prove it. What, se we are, what, what sexes have we got on display here? These are Venus figurines. So what do you reckon? Here? Yeah, there, there's a lovely Venus figurine, little, nice little bandos and itsy bitsy lingerie and so forth. Oh, look, look at that one. Oh, well, what does that look like? Yeah, it's pretty female, bit of a bulge, but I, I mean, you know, what is that? This one, nice tits, but oh, wow, what about the rest? Um, we, we'll come to the tallies later. Um, these beautiful examples from Mejin in the Ukraine. So this is Donny Vesnich, this is Kostyenki, Ukraine. This is Mejin in Ukraine. Formal, abstract motifs, patterning, repeated. And what is it? That is a female shape, the buttocks, but also, is it female? Is it male? Mejin, look at the extra, and how small that is, but that's the centimetre scale, so it's again, it's like a hand. Look at the abstract, beautiful uh, creation of, in uh, ivory. And these, there's just so clear. Don't ever sneak to the Czech site. Testicles or tits? I don't know. What's the date on measures? What, what's which? Date. Um, they're in 20,000. Uh, the Ukraine sites will be, these are Gravetti and they'll be. Yeah, I think it's 20,000. I think I'm right. I don't know. Um, so it's like height of Ice Age kind of area. area. Um, Donovan's Nietzsche is earlier than that. Imagine isn't that far after Donovan's Nietzsche. Um, it's 27,000. I mean, again, what it's spread leg figure, female, but is it male, female. The, the, ambi the gender ambiguity is just. Yeah, and now I'm going to absolutely prove it because it's actually referred to. These are Venus figurines called phalliforms. Hey, yeah, right, okay. So what is going on? We have this extra. I, I hope you're appreciating the extraordinary sophistication of gender construction amongst hunter-gatherers here. Ritual power is expressed with these double sex. Now, if you're thinking back to the Bushman, the, the, the girl with the bows and arrows and these penises and vulvas, yeah, yes, quite. So they can tell us about what's going on with that. And, and we've got this, these examples, these are French and Italian examples. I mean, these aren't quite big enough to be dildos, I don't think. But they could be, I don't know, you know, size, size doesn't always matter. <laughs> so Venus of La Salle, um, very famous piece, 25,000 years old, a rock shelter of Dordogne, bas relief. Um, she was rubbed all over with ochre, as some of you know, ochre is quite interesting, I suppose. Um, and she has this horn with the enigmatic 13 notches. I like number 13, we can discuss that later. Um, it, it, some have called it, Le Ragoron first called it a bison horn, but actually it might be an ibex horn. But again, female identity of the animal, the 13 notation we talk about, um, the reproductive potency of the... Now, but I wanted to say about the Venus of La Salle, even though she is thousands of years, so she's 25, 26,000, um, and she is thousands of miles away from the... Um, girl, the Zimbabwe maiden who had the rattle, the Luna Cleasant rattle, we actually have a, a, the iconography is so similar, it's such a similar grammar in these uh, imagery here um, that I think it's something to think about. Um, but uh, the other theme I wanted to bring out was this identity of women, it's not Eland in Europe, it's bison. So this, uh, Le these are sketches from Le Ragouron. He's identified, he's taken that as bison horn, which may be. But this is the, one of the most famous sequences, the famous Femme Bison, Femme Bison, the women bison from Peshmel cave. Um, 
and <coughs> we, we talked about the metamorphosis of the healer into becoming an eland, the dying eland. Here we have the the metamorphosis of bison to woman, dancing woman. So it's the with the eland. What is so special about the eland is its fatness. The male eland has huge fatness that is the ultimate desirable prey animal that's so important. The fatness is the shoulder of the the flesh shoulder of the bison, which becomes the buttocks here as the woman is the dancing um, uh, woman in the so this is a sequence of metamorphosis of transformation another amazing bison down here guarding like the bison is pawing the ground and about to charge at anybody who tries to approach these beautiful female coalition here um, and Isteritz, I'm going to show you this in more. This is Isteritz, but let's just have a look in real detail. Isteritz is an um, ivory blade and two sort of north of Spain and two sides. And this is like the Magdalenian, um, it's about 13, 15,000 years. It's quite re relatively quite recent. So on one side is evidently, there's no head there, but breast, pregnant belly, arrow in the buttock of the woman and the other side and the woman's being pursued by a beast headed individual and the <laughs> other side is the bison with the hair up and the arrows in the fleshy shoulder so woman's buttocks fleshy shoulder bison woman one side and the other side very nice one Okay, if we come to the shamanic hypothesis, I, I would run the shamanic hypothesis past all of these imageries, but I would not lose hold of the gender ritual aspect at all, because they, they're bound to both be operative. But here we find in the Peshmel, um, the beautiful horses of Peshmel with the handprints. Peshmel is the one where the women bison, will bison transform into women and the women to bison. And we have these extraordinary uh, male figures shot with arrows. So this is very similar to the Zimbabwe uh, fat maiden with her lunar crescent right next to the, shot, the, the male figure shot with arrows. And we have another example in Kunyak, not far away from Peshmel, both on the edges of Dordogne, the lot region, these caves. Um, so there is plenty, uh, I'm going to skip the chiefly rank bit, that's uh, uh, an image from the very in, insides of the Lascaux, the very famous Lascaux cave, and again I'm going to compare the bison to the imagery of the eland in the Sun Rock art. This, is, this bison here has, is losing his guts, dying of a wound, hair up erect, blood streaming from the nose and there is the mighty hunter or the shaman going into something like the um, state of trance that we saw of the healer lying on his back um, yeah, for the jeune troisi so we're, we're again seeing the equation of the healer with this dying of the bison of the mighty bison um, the mightiest you know animal of the cosmos um, as far as the sun are concerned, the eland is the mightiest animal of their cosmos. What does the bird represent? Yeah. Who the heck knows? <laughs> you tell me. I mean, what do we know? We, we're looking at, at, at um, a very inside the, uh, the middle of Lascaux, like a you would to get into the pit of Lascaux you it's like the advanced stage of a sequence of initiation ritual so we would expect this could be some esoteric shamanic initiation possibly yeah very like yes 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 that would definitely be because that would be part of the experience of the healing they go go to yeah definitely and yeah, that's part of the expression of potency yes yes um, so I can talk about that. The bird is the other world. The bird is... I, yeah, it flies what could it be? The other it's yeah. talking about the other world, talking about the bird. So this is deep inside, deep in a pit in the cave, but it's flying out. I'm making it up as I go along now. <laughs> but I can tell you about the bison, but I'm not sure about the bird.
you t you tell me. Um, but it, it's uh, magic. It is not a literal. This just just make it clear. It's not a literal scene of hunting or anything like it. It's depiction of some form of shamanic experience or initiation that would be given to young men as they're going through. This this is probably very male oriented. It's like an initiation. Um, lunar cal I, I haven't got time to talk about the lunar calendars, lunar notations, Alexander Marshak's amazing work. This comes from Donovan Nietzsche. Um, so yeah, the lunar calendars and the lunar cosmology. Um, this is late Magdalenian. We're nearly finished. This late Magdalenian, because I want to get to the last image. Um, and where the Venus figurines were intensively curated an extraordinary produced an extraordinary fine detail that was very individualistic a way back this like 20 well 10,000 years before these figures these late Magdalenian figures are we're finding a sort of iconography which becomes like a shorthand it's almost like writing so that okay we can see this is clearly a female figure with the narrow waist bulging buttocks bit of a tit bit, and the hands in their dancing mode um, but then it becomes this very quick straight line buttocks just that just that to indicate woman um, and here Alexander Marshak was analyzing this notation um, and I can talk about him a bit more in the questions if anyone wants to know and he's looking at this so horse here rather than bison we got a wound wounded animal and the line this is a picket line of females you don't they don't look like females but that's that's the logical analysis here line curve possibly the direction of the curve is indicating something about reproductive state maybe pregnant woman not pregnant woman possibly um, so that horse is under charge of that picket line of females in some way uh, beautiful from the Gönnersdorf uh, near Cologne, southern Germany, dancing coalitions that have been carved into fairly soft limestone plaquettes. Um, and again, that very it's, it's easy to do it because the iconography is now incredibly simple, but you've still got all this detail of the abstract motifs, the geometric motifs, to indicate grit your power, moving to the other world. Um, and just to note that the women have babies on their backs. They're dancing with their babies. So it's not pornography. So, sorry? It's not pornography. Yeah, that's not pornography. Uh, not, pornography doesn't depa depict women with babies on their backs, really. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my, la my finale is these extraordinary ritual plaquettes. Um, well, that's Gunnersdorf, the row of dancing women. Uh, but this is La Linde from the Dordogne, France. Um, and the in incredible shot uh, provided by Alexander Marshak let us use this photograph before he, well, before he died, which is um, very kind of him. And uh, yeah, uh, it, it's, gro it's groved and ground into limestone, so it's portable art, it's not art on a wall. This is speaking much more of being inside a, a women's ritual context. Um, and Marshak, Alexander Marshak made a very close examination of the ways the marks had been made here and who had made, how had they been made all at once by one person? Or were they being repeated by different people at different times? And his argument was that there was, there was a ritual time factoring, that these, the grooves here had been repeatedly made over many sort of layers of time, layers of occasions, ritual occasions. And we, and you can, I'm leaving it to you to make interpretations. How do we interpret it? It's quite clear where the re reproductive potency, the power, these are like energy sockets of power being linked up together. Um, and if you go back to the actual plaquette, we've got, we have more than one dancing female there, but that, that detail from Marshak is just showing uh, what that really is saying. Um, very final, yeah, just, just wanted to think to say, 
we're looking at these images that, that's why they, 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 these almost have the quality of Matisse drawings they're, they're just so that's why you can sort of forgive them for bringing the Matisse into the Ice Age art because you can see this kind of thing there's a rejoicing we're talking about images from the height of the Ice Age where people are rejoicing in their luxury of being able to sort of lie, lie around naked um, uh, oh, there, there would be a whole story to tell about about this imagery from Gabi Yu as well, but I'm not going to have time. But just to note the grid patterning and the you know very overt figurative drawing of a of a woman as if in child ready for childbirth um, and potency, reproductive potency. That's enough. <coughs> Sorry. Yes. <laughs> 